Good morning. Good morning. Great to see all of you here today. My name is Andrew. If I have not met you, um, I am one of the pastors here at City View, and it is a privilege for me to come before you and share God's word today. Um, And before we get started, before we dive into God's word, I want to just mention a couple of things uh, before we get started here. Uh, First, as we've been doing for the past couple of weeks, we're going to start by taking a few minutes to uh, fill out the connection notebook. If you are seated at the end of your rows, you'll notice if you look on the ground, there's a black notebook there. And if you would just pick that up and just fill out some contact information on there and then pass it to the person next to you until it gets to the other end. And after you're done, just put it on the ground and one of our ushers will pick it up. But this is just our way of staying connected with you. And so if you could do that, we would greatly appreciate it. And so that's the first thing I want to bring to your attention. The second thing is, is that if you are a single young adult or a college student between the ages of 18 and 30, notice that I'm being very specific in how I'm describing that, a single young adult or a college student between the ages of 18 to 30, uh, my friend Pastor Logan and I, he's the one that just did the baptism, we want to invite you to our very first ever Friendsgiving potluck event, which will be on Friday, November the 19th in a couple of weeks. And so if, you can, uh, if you're interested in joining, if you're interested in finding more information, Pastor Logan and I will be there after service at the ministry desk. You can stop by for more information to sign up for that. And so again, if you are a single young adult or a college student between the ages of 18 to 30, uh, we would love to connect with you and invite you to come out. Now, for those of us here, if you are joining us for the first time and if you're worshiping with us for the first time, we've been going through a series on the book of Exodus. And the central question that this book is asking is, who is God? Who is God? And in other words, who is the Lord Yahweh that the book is book of Exodus is asking? And more specifically, it's asking us, who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship and serve the gods of Egypt? And are you going to worship Pharaoh? Or are you going to worship and serve the Lord Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And not just for the Israelites. I think this is ultimately the question that that God is asking all of us today. Who or what are you going to worship and serve? And as some of you hear that, you may be thinking, well, I don't believe in the gods of Egypt. I don't worship idols and statues of animals. I don't even know who this Pharaoh guy is. I don't even care to know who this guy is. And whether or not you believe in God or whether you believe in the Bible or in the Exodus story or not, I believe that this is the fundamental fundamental question that all of us need to answer. Who or what will you worship and serve? Are you going to worship the Lord God or something or someone else? Now, if you recall a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Keith did a great job covering nine of the ten, ten what he calls supernatural plagues that's listed in Exodus chapters 7 through 11. And that term supernatural, if you weren't here for that, can be understood as events that are extremely rare but are not completely or totally unknown. And the reason why God brought all these plagues was to show that he was sovereign, that he was sovereign over over nature and creation, that he was sovereign over the Egyptian gods, and that he was sovereign over Pharaoh himself, who was considered a god. In fact, Amun-Ra, the king of the Egyptian gods, was considered the father and the protector of Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh himself was considered a god. And this is all very important. Why? Because as we'll see from our passage in the chapters that we'll be covering today, God is about to demonstrate his sovereign power, his sovereign authority, and his sovereign dominion over not only the king of Egypt, but over the gods of Egypt. But before executing that final plague, God does something remarkable, something that would change the entire course of history forever. And so with all that said, I want to invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And as you open and look at that, you're looking at 51 verses. And don't worry, we're not going to cover all. We're not going to go through all. I'm not going to read all 51 verses, just portions of it. We're going to jump around between chapters 12 and chapter 13. So Exodus chapter 12. And if we could all stand uh, together in honor of the reading of God's word. Let's all stand. And if you're watching us online, please uh, stand and join us as well. This is the word of God Starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is to be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of your year. 
tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their father's families, one animal per family. If the household is too small for the whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest to his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each will eat. You must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. They must then take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. And they are to eat the meat that night. They should eat it roasted over the fire along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in boiling water, but only roasted over fire. Its head, as well as its legs and its inner organs, you must not leave any of it until morning, or any part of it left until morning you must burn. Here is how you must eat it. You must be dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. I am the Lord and I will execute judgment against the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you that when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Jump down to verse 29. It says, Now at midnight, the Lord struck every firstborn male in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and every firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up, he along with all of his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud wailing throughout Egypt because there wasn't a house without someone dead. He summoned Moses and Aaron during the night and said, get out immediately from my people, both you and the Israelites and go worship the God as you have said. Take even your flocks and your herds as you asked and leave and also bless me. And lastly, jump to chapter 13, verse three. It says, then Moses said to the people, Remember this day when you came out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, for the Lord brought you out of here by the strength of his hand. Nothing leaven may be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Hevites, and Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers. He says, he... That he, will give, that he will give you a land flowing with milk and honey. You must carry out this ceremony in this month. For seven days you must eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there is to be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread is to be eaten for those seven days. Nothing leavened may be found among you. And no yeast may be found among you in your territory. Verse 8, this is very important. And on that day, explain to your son... This is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Let it serve as a sign for you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead so that the Lord's instruction may be in your mouth. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a strong hand. Keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. It's the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word, God. And I pray that as we hear what you have to say to us this morning, that, God, that we would not just be here and be hearers of the word, but may we be doers and respond by doing in what you have called us to do. And so, Lord, we give our time to you. God, this is your word. And so, God, may you speak to us through it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in these two chapters, um, we... I, as I study, I, I find three major themes or movements here. And the first one that we see is a time of preparation. And these are all in alliteration, so it's easier to remember. Like, it just reminds me of my Baptist roots. The first one is a time of preparation where, God, where God's people are instructed to prepare in anticipation for what was to come. So that's the first one. The second one is God's protection. And this is where they are protected from God's fierce judgment, as we just read. 
And the last one is this command to praise, where God's people are commanded to remember and rejoice in what he has done for them. So three things, prepare, protection, and praise. The first one we're going to be looking at is preparation. And we read in verses 1 through 13 where God commanded Moses and Aaron to go and tell the Israelites what they were to do in preparation for the final plague or the final judgment that was about, that he was about to bring on the land. Land. And he said that you are go, you are to go and take a year old unblemished lamb or goat and slaughter it. And then they were to take some of the blood from this lamb and paint it on the door frames of their house. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but as you can see from these verses, God gives them very specific instructions on how they were to prepare and how they were to eat and what they were to eat this lamb with. And even in the manner they were supposed to eat it. He says, be ready, be in a a, a posture of haste as you eat this meal. And traditionally, this meal has been referred to as the Passover And to this day, the Jewish people observe Passover every single year. In fact, it still remains as a central event in the Jewish religious calendar. And for those of us here today, it would be equivalent to our 4th of July, our Independence Day, where we won our independence, where we celebrate and remember our independence from Great Britain. And again, God gave them very specific instructions on what they were to do in preparation for what he was about to do. And the reason why, as we read, was that that night he was going to execute his judgment by striking down all the firstborn males in Egypt. And the only way, the only way that they were going to be spared from this judgment was by applying the blood of the lamb on their door hosts. And it says in verse 13 that this would be the distinguishing mark so that when God sees the blood, he will see it and he will pass over that house. He will pass his judgment over from that house. Hence the name Passover. Now, as you hear all that, I want you to just pause and and think about this for a moment. Because I think that We sort of gloss over this story because it's become so familiar to so many of us. Because if you've grown up in the church or if you've been going to church for some time now, chances are you've either heard or read about or seen the story of Exodus in some shape or form. And not only that, but we now have movies, feature-length movies and books and documentaries and even animated films on the book of Exodus and the Exodus story. You know, recently um, I visited one of our life groups is what we call our small groups. And during our time, the the small group leader um, showed a clip from a TV show that's produced in Brazil. And it's actually produced this year. So it's fairly new. And, you know, normally these things are pretty cheesy, but I mean, it was a little cheesy, but I mean, I thought it it wasn't too bad. It was pretty good. Um, And it even had these nice special effects. And so it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. But again, I bring this up because I think whenever we hear this story, we tend to gloss over and we say, well, you know, I've heard that before, man. I grew up with the felt boards and seeing all the animals and all these things up there. I know the story inside and out. I've heard it a hundred different ways and it's become so familiar to us. But try to place yourselves in the shoes of these Israelites who are hearing this for the very first time. I mean, can you begin to imagine what it must have been like for them as they heard all of this? I mean, it's, what I, it's how I picture the scene. Some of them would come and say, look, so let me get this straight, Moses. Let me get this straight. You're telling me that God is about to unleash his judgment on the land by sending the destroyer. The destroyer, the most powerful, the most unstoppable force in the universe, and it's going to literally cut through Egypt, the greatest military and political power the world has ever seen. And the only thing, the only thing that's going to save me is a lamb. I want to make sure I heard you correctly, Mo. (laughs) You're You're telling me that the only thing that's going to stand between me And this destroyer, the most unstoppable force, is a lamb? 
What do you mean one of those things out there, those fluffy little, cute little, innocent, helpless things out there, that is what's going to save me from the destroyer? He says, exactly. You are absolutely correct. The only way you'll be saved from my judgment is by taking this lamb, killing it, and then putting its blood on your doorpost. And when the destroyer sees the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, he will pass over you and you will be saved. Can you begin to imagine what it must have been like when they heard this? Not only that, but you have to understand that this plague was very different from the other ones that came before, the other nine. With this one, they had to go and they had to prepare a bunch of things for what was about to come. And afterwards, they had to wait. That night, they had to wait in anticipation, whether, knowing whether or not God was actually going to save them and do what he said he was going to do. The destroyer is going to come through the land. And we're just waiting and hoping, is God going to judge us? Are we safe? And again, the... This must have taken just a tremendous amount of faith to not only go through with what they did, but to sit and wait. In many ways, you could say that they had to take a leap of faith in waiting. And likewise, for some of you here today, you're going through a season of preparing or waiting. And maybe some of you are waiting in anticipation of what God wants you to do and maybe where he's telling you to go and what he wants you to do. For some of you, maybe God, maybe you're waiting for God to bless you with something. Maybe a new job. Maybe that special someone. Maybe you're waiting for him to bless you with a child. And it's just so hard, all the waiting, so hard, and you're just tired of waiting. Maybe some of you are waiting for God to answer a prayer. And you've been crying out to him day after day after day, prayer after prayer. And at this point, you're not even sure if God is going to answer your prayers. Or if he need, even if he'll show up. Or even if he's listening. And that describes any of you here today. I want to encourage you with all the sincerity and compassion that I have for you to remain steadfast in waiting in hope. You know, it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, it says, Humble yourselves before, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, in his time. And as you wait on him, you are to cast all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares about you. And so if you're here and if you're in a season of waiting, I want to say to you that even though the waiting may be so hard, that it will never lead to disappointment. And God, our Heavenly Father, cares for you more than you will ever know. And he will lift you up in his time. And friends, his timing is always perfect. God, God is never early. God is never late. God is always right on time. Amen. Amen. So the Israelites did everything the Lord instructed them to do. They waited in anticipation for God's judgment. And it says in verse 29 that at midnight the Lord struck every firstborn male in the land, including the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn among all the livestock. And it says that there was a loud wailing and weeping throughout Egypt because there wasn't a house without someone dead. And when it was all said and done, and at the very end, God did keep his promise not only to execute judgment on Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt, but yes, to save and deliver his people from slavery and bondage, just like he said he would do from the very beginning. And the amazing thing is that their deliverance, that their salvation wasn't based on how well they had prepared. It wasn't based on the intensity or the sincerity of the faith that they exercised but solely on the basis of the blood that was applied on their doorposts. In other words, their salvation, their deliverance rested on them coming under the blood covering of the lamb. 
You know, this isn't the only place where they see this language, this image of a blood covering occurring. And the very, this very first instance of this can be found way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And it says that when they ate of the fruit, that both of their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed because they realized, oh my goodness, she's naked. Oh my goodness, he's naked. And they realized that for the very first time. And so what do they do? They sew fig leaves together. And they try to cover over their nakedness, but it wasn't enough. In other words, it wasn't enough to cover over their sin and their shame. And so it says that the Lord God came down. He came down and that he made garments out of skin, which meant that something had to die. And something had to shed its blood, and that blood was shed. And with this garment made out of skin, it says that the Lord clothed and covered over their nakedness. And this image of this blood covering and covering over and clothing is found all throughout Scripture, with this ultimate fulfillment being found in Jesus, who is called the Lamb of God who shed his blood and gave his life for the forgiveness of our sins. And it says in Galatians chapter 3, that as children of God through faith in Jesus, that we are now what? We are clothed with his righteousness. We are covered with his righteousness. This means that if you have placed your faith in Christ, then you are under the covering of his blood. And you are now clothed with his righteousness. And so that when God sees us, and so that God, when God sees you and me, he doesn't see our sins. He doesn't see our mistakes. He sees the perfect unblemished righteousness of his son over us. That's good news. And it is solely on the basis of the blood of Jesus that we are saved and not by our good works. It's not based on what we have or have not done but by faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. And as D.A. Carson puts it, this is what silences the accuser. It is the blood that silences the accuser of the brother that accuses us before God. And it's the blood that silences our conscience when it accuses us directly. And so we don't have to ride around and worry, wondering whether we're good enough or whether God can love us enough, even though we mess up time and time and time again. Because as the old hymn says, my faith, my faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It is enough, friends. It is enough that Jesus died, that he died for you and me. This is the basis of our faith. And this is the gospel that silences the guilt and the shame of the accuser. And what this means is that our salvation isn't based on the intensity of our faith, but on the object of our faith. And that object is none other than Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And likewise for the Israelites, they too were saved by the covering of the blood of the Lamb. And the only way that they were going to be saved was by coming under God's provision for them. But for those who weren't, they received the fierce judgment of God. And it says that he did what he did to, sh- he said that he did what he said he would do by striking down every firstborn male in Egypt. And once Pharaoh realizes that he can no longer stand against the Lord, he calls Moses and he tells them to leave immediately. Get out of here. And as a result of all this, God's people are finally free from bondage and slavery under Egypt. And if you are here today, if you are here today and you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus, the good news The good news is that you too can be set free from the bondage of sin. We want to give you an opportunity to do that at the end. 
But as I said before, the, the, the Passover stands as a central event in the Jewish calendar to this day. And over and over we see in chapters 12 and 13 that God instructs his people to observe and celebrate it as the day when the Lord delivered them from judgment and bondage. And I love what it says in chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, that they were to explain, tell the story of what this meant to their children. So, they, so that when they ask, what does this all mean? Why, do we, why are we doing this year after year? They are to respond by telling them the story of how God rescued them and how he brought them out of Egypt by the strength of his mighty hand. And they were to pass this story along from generation to generation as a lasting ordinance so that they would never forget what God did for them. And so why is this important for us? And why is it that God has to repeat himself over and over in these two chapters? Well, I think it's because we too, we tend to forget. You know, there's a story about a pastor who was called to a new church. And on his first Sunday, he preached a powerful message, a powerful sermon that was biblically sound, theologically accurate, and applicable to everyday life. And as the people heard that, they all nudged each other and says, man, I like this guy. This is our guy. This is just who we needed. Well, the next Sunday, the pastor went up and he preached the exact same message that was biblically sound, theologically accurate, and applicable to everyday life. And the people thought it was a little strange, but they didn't mind it too much. They thought, yeah, it was still pretty good. But then the following Sunday, he preached that same message again, and the people started to get a little concerned. And so some of the church members approached a group of deacons and said, you know, if that pastor preaches the same sermon one more time, I think y'all gonna have a little talk with him. Well, lo and behold, the pastor preached the exact same message for the fourth time in a row. So the deacons gathered together and they went to the pastor and they said to him, pastor, we're, we're a bit concerned that you keep preaching the same sermon every Sunday. I mean, don't you have any other sermons that you can preach? And the pastor listened very carefully, listened very patiently. Then he took off his glasses and folded his arms and he responded, I do have other sermons. But this church hasn't obeyed the first one yet. <laughs> you, know, you know, one of the themes that we find over and over in God's word is this command to remember. Remember. And the reason why is because we all too often we tend to forget. What do we forget? We forget that God is good, that he is faithful in all that he does. We forget that our sins have been forgiven. We forget that God is abundantly, infinitely gracious and merciful towards us. And we forget about his great love for us. So this is why we need regular reminders. And friends, I believe, this is why I believe Sundays are so, so important for us. You see, Sundays isn't just something that we, are, that we are supposed to do, something good that we should do. Because what we do to, together here on Sunday not only provides spiritual and personal benefit and value to us, us, it is eternally significant. It is eternally significant because it is a time when we come together to lift our eyes up to Jesus, where, we take, where we're reminded of who God is and what he has done, where we take our eyes off the temporal things of this world and we lift our eyes and we look to that which is eternal. It is where our hearts are tuned and turned from chasing after counterfeit gods to worshiping and serving the Lord and God. And it is where we gather together to rejoice and celebrate and speak over one another, as it says in Ephesians chapter 5, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with our heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we gather to worship. And the point is that it's not that attending church makes us a Christian. The point is that attending church is what we Christians do. Because it demonstrates that the spirit of Christ is in us 
And if the spirit of Christ is indeed in us, then we will desire to be with his people. And friends, this is why what we do here on Sundays matters. And this is why we we do what we do, why we gather together, because there is power in that. It is of eternal significance. And so I've said a lot of things, but what should be our response to what we have heard from God's word today? Three things, and then I'll get ready to close here. First, we are to remember. What is our response? We are to remember. We are to remember the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. And we are to remember how he gave his life and shed his blood for the forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future. And for those of you who are here, as I said, and you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus, maybe it's your first Sunday here, or maybe you've been coming for a few weeks. What I want to do is I want to invite you to confess. Confess your need for his forgiveness. And receive the free gift of his grace today. And if you're not really sure how to do that, if you're not really sure what that means, we want to invite you to come and pray with one of our pastors and elders up here as we get ready to close. So first, we need to remember. And that goes for all of us. Second, we are to receive God's abundant mercy and grace that he has freely given to us through faith in his son. You know, one of my favorite songs comes from Lamentation chapter 3, where it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Friends, we are to receive God's mercies and grace anew and afresh each and every day. Because the same grace that saves us is the same grace that sustains us day after day. And his mercy for you, his grace for you, his faithfulness towards you is new every morning. And we need to receive that. Third, finally, we are called to rejoice. Rejoice in the eternal assurance and the hope that we have in our risen Savior. You know, as you can tell, I love old hymns and songs. And one of my favorite hymns goes like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You know, wherever you may be in your faith journey today, whether you would say that you're far from Jesus or whether you would say that you're walking closely with him, all these chapters in Exodus, these two chapters should serve as a powerful and humbling reminder of who God is and what he has done for us. That it's not just a story from ages past, but it is a story for us. So as you get ready to close our time together, I want to give us an opportunity to do, to respond to what we have heard and what we have received from his word. And so if he would, he would join me in in bowing in prayer as we get ready to close. And if you're here this morning, and as I said, and 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 you say that you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus, I want to invite you to come and receive him today. As I mentioned, we're going to have Uh, some of our pastors and elders come up here and pray with you if you'd like. But more than anything, whether you come up here or not, more than anything, we don't want you to miss out on the opportunity to receive him today. And so if you feel that God has been speaking to you this morning, we want you to come up. We want to allow us to pray for you and with you. For some of you here today, you would say that you're in a season of waiting and hoping and Maybe you're at a place where you're just tired and you're worn out from all the waiting. If that's you, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so if that describes you, I want to encourage you this morning to remain steadfast, to cast all of your cares on him. Why? Because 
He cares. God, our heavenly Father, cares for you. And God will be faithful to lift you up in his time. And lastly, if you're here today and you would say that there's no way that God could love me or forgive someone like me, don't you realize what, what I've done? Don't you realize who I am? And if that describes you today, I want to remind you that if you are in Christ, that you are covered by the blood of Jesus and that you are now clothed with his righteousness. And because of this, you can come before the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that you are fully loved, that you are fully forgiven in Jesus. And so wherever you may be today, I want to invite you to respond to God in prayer. If you need to come up and receive, pray. If you, want, if you would like one of us to pray for you, please come up. Don't miss this opportunity to receive and to hear from God today. Would you pray with me as we get ready to close this prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for your goodness and your grace on our lives. We pray that, God, that, Lord, as we have just heard, may our confidence not rest in what we have or have not done, not in our good works, any righteousness that we have in and of ourselves, but in Christ alone, the solid rock, may we stand. Because all of the ground is sinking sand, all of the ground is sinking stand, God. And remind us today that it is enough, it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for the forgiveness of all of my sins. So we thank you for that. We thank you for your word this morning for us. Committed to you in Jesus' name.